Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to What's Brewing, Ben's Town Hall. Right on, huh? And of course, brought to us by our generous sponsors, one of which I'd like to point out is our venue sponsor, the local and emerging business of the year, Volcanic Theater Pub. Thank you, Darren. And of course, by the generous donations and SunWest Builders. I thank them so much. They are the reason we were able to bring the price to something that the community can truly engage. You guys, thank you so much. I see you back there. there. I don't know they are. And of course, all of you. Thank you for coming out and participating. We have had every size and capacity of venue and engagement and participation here the last several months that many of you have seen. But how many of you, this is your first time at a What's Brewing Ben's Town Hall? Just a quick show of hands. Awesome, so you, these matter, these things matter to you because somebody came up to me, oh, Tim Casey, whatever. <laughs> In which persona was here tonight? <laughs> but these items matter to us and we hope to continue to bring more of this to the proverbial table. Tonight we were, of course, a little challenged with the gorgeous weather out there, but these issues do matter. We hope you will write us with them, that we will plug in more often with our delegates that are here joining us tonight and that you'll bring your voice to the table. It's going to be important that here in Central Oregon we understand what our issues and opportunities are and that like tonight, we get a chance to look ahead and strategize. That's gonna be what the difference is, right? Don't you agree? I mean, are we always looking for a voice? When we, we make key partnerships, you're a part of it. So a big thank you to all of you. A big round of applause to all of you, would you? Speaking of keeping our government affairs hat and our amazing community affairs council, I'd like to encourage you to invite all your friends and family next month to join us for What's Brewing. We're every first Tuesday of the month, and I'm really excited to share that we have a very special topic, the business of being a veteran. Apropos with 4th of July, from hiring and re-entry to employment dollars that are out there to local legislature, or, or, state legislation that we know that was coming around and more, how it impacts their families, and of course, the big obvious, healthcare. And we have an amazing panel and people participate, participating. Trick V, I know you're already here. You said, I would love to hire, and we do. Many of these qualified leaders with amazing experience and outstanding expertise, you get through the language of the resume. But maybe a small business might look at this and go, are they amazing or what does this say? This is great to me. So understanding that and what some of their issues are. So please join us next month. I wanna let you know, all veterans enter for $5, okay? So just heads up, get them to register. We'll have a tab, they can enter for $5. Also on the list, many of you were handed, I hope, a flyer on the way in. I'm not sure if you were. This is huge. The first ever. Whoa. Representative Huffman and Representative Wisman said they just paid for the, just offered to pay for the first, how many? 20, 30, 40. For 20 veterans <laughs> at next month. Wow, that is huge. <laughs> Robbie, there you go. Thank you both. Right on, that's what I'm talking about. Well, this is also another great opportunity, and it's the first ever. This is not your average state of the city or state of the county address coming up, ladies and gentlemen. This is your state of the community address, and this is next Thursday morning, so be sure you get registered. It's coming right around, and I'm telling you, the stakeholders are at the table, and they're making it fresh, and they want you engaged, and they want you to spread the word and get everybody there. 90% of your tax dollars go to the city of Bend, the county, the Parks and Rec District, and the schools. I know there's an, excuse me, the Bend Lapine School District. I know there's smaller amounts in other areas. Those four entities will be up on deck engaging in roundtable conversation, not only with one another asking and talking about how they manage growth, manage your tax dollars, 
and manage community-wide issues like OSU Cascades, affordable housing, Mirror Pond. How do they collaborate? How do they reinvest in the community? And key stakeholders will be there as well. But it's not going to be as engaging or as informative or as fresh if you're not there. So pass the word and make sure you get an opportunity to be there. That's next Thursday morning, State of the Community Address, first ever. And speaking of all these leaders, it is time this time an opportunity to still nominate people for Leadership Bend. We just are getting through with a brand new class. How many Leadership Bend folks are here right tonight? Tony, a couple others, Carrie, and alumni in the room. I love it. How many alumni in the room? This is a fantastic program for local emerging leaders. Welcome, Representative Conger. Thank you. Appreciate the chair. No, it's just fine. We love it to be here. Nominations and applications are being accepted. So tonight's topic, 2015 Legislative Outlook and Opportunities, a conversation with our legis legislators. This truly is not only an update from all of them and a sneak peek into some of the things that they're working on for drafts, but again, our voice, and they want to hear from you. They've told me as such, we're going to key up a few questions. And there are those of you in the room who can also uh, partake in every which way that you desire. But let's make sure we do that. In the, mean, in the meantime, I'd like to introduce each one of them that have joined us today. So Senator Tim Canope, Senator Ted Ferrioli, Representative Jason Conger, Representative Jean Wisnett, Representative John Huffman, and Representative Mike McLean. Big round of applause for they all be gathered tonight. Joining me as my cohort and co-moderator on my Community Affairs Council, maybe some of you have known him as a former mayor in the city of Bend. He is also a partner at Valiant LLC, an attorney at law, and has a new business called uh, Local Inside Local Government Affairs at website.com. Please welcome Jeff Eager. So on that note, Jeff, if you'll join me at this point, we hope all of you will engage. Just grab us with your hands up, wink, make eye contact, just try not to trip us. I want to toss this right out onto the table. We've got a lot going on with OSU Cascades. Uh, we know that you were all intimately involved on a legislative level in making sure that there was some funding that came down the pike but we're going through uh, a lot of different uh, things that are stopping it and slowing it down right now. Some appeals processes, and we know that with that, it might extend things. And if it does this extend this process for OSU Cascades, does that mean that their funding is in jeopardy? Okay. Jump, jump in. Jump in, grab that mic. Pass around. Okay. And we might want to actually throw a microphone to uh, Becky Johnson um, that can maybe answer some of the, the more detailed uh, ramifications of what's going on. But um, I'm on the Ways and Means Capital Construction Subcommittee and Full Ways and Means. Uh, Mike's on Full Ways and Means with me. And um, so we, you know, as a Central Oregon team, we really went to bat in the 13 and 14 sessions to get the total funding package for OSU Cascades and COCC. And it was based on a budget that had uh, been developed by Becky Johnson and Jim Middleton with the assumption that they would be able to take the funding and start building right away. And then eventually, sooner than later, get OSU Cascades out of the COCC building onto their campus. COCC then would start reconstruction of their building and it was based on you know, market rates and labor rates and recessionary rates of the 13-14 session. And you know, as I read in the Bend Bulletin, that there are, and, I, and I'm not judging anybody, please, I, I don't live in Bend, and so please forgive me if I'm stepping on toes, but as I read in the, the Bulletin over the last uh, month or so about the challenges that OSU Cascades is facing, uh, on uh, neighborhood and land use and, and that kind of stuff. 
I quickly went to the financial end of it, and I thought, wow, if this gets held up for very long, if it gets appealed, if it gets sent to Luba, and all of that stuff that could happen, and this is held up a year or longer, and I haven't even talked to Becky until this week about what the ramifications would be, but it could be so costly that it could really back us up because we don't have a plan B. We got from the legislature in 13 and 14 combined enough money for the COCC and OSU Cascades plan. And again, that was based on what we thought we could build out for at the time. If this is held up and let's say OSU Cascades has to stay in the COCC building and pay rent for another year, and it puts construction off. My oldest son just got back on yesterday with Knife River. So, you know, we're starting to, to see glimmers of construction eking up just a bit, not as much as we'd like, but just a bit. And so what is this gonna do if the project is held up too long? And uh, I had kind of put words in Becky's mouth. I said, there really is no plan B. We really got enough money to do what needed to be done in plan A. And so if it's delayed and postponed, what could the ramifications be? And I think that's a topic that we really all need to talk about tonight. And particularly the Bend business community needs to be aware of what's at risk. So I'd just like to say- The answer, the answer to the question is <laughs> not at this time. However, it's good that we have business leaders here today and that we, your representatives in Salem, every day we get other business people in the same situation that are waiting for appeals on land use uh, and um, and they're using their own money. Here we're using taxpayers' money that we've that uh, we've all worked together and John had to lead on to uh, set it aside for that purpose. But uh, uh, not in my backyard. Uh, uh, don't affect the environment. Uh, we face those issues every day in Salem for business leaders, too. I'm Becky Johnson, Vice President for OSU Cascades. And first, I'd like to thank the senators and the representatives for your support in the last legislative session. It really has been a priority for Central Oregon for many years to have a four-year university. And so thank you for, uh, for providing the support that we needed. It's absolutely true that uh, construction costs are rising, the economy is changing. At first we thought we could purchase existing buildings and the market changed just in the amount of time that it took to get bonds appropriated. So uh, we're in a situation now where we really need to get moving on this and get it developed. We of course want to satisfy every uh, requirement of the Bend City Code. Uh, so we're not asking for exceptions to that. Uh, we want to work with our neighbors. We want to be a great neighbor to uh, the people that are around our new campus. We want to be partners with people in Central Oregon. So we're really trying to listen and figure out how we can address the issues that people have raised. And uh, I just think that if we can get through this, we've already delayed one year. Hopefully it won't be more than a year to get this campus uh, developed now and in place by fall of 2016. I will not be coming back and asking you for any of the legal costs that we're having to spend on this. Uh, it might mean that we reduce the scope of our first building to pay for those legal costs, so there's, there's ramifications for, for these appeals, but we will, we will handle that and we won't come back until we're, re we're ready to expand to the next phase. Thank you. Jamie, do we have the press here? Press here. We do. KTVZ is in the room, and I'm not sure if the bulletin is in the room or not. Grab your mic, please, for President. We have a lot of people coming and going into Central Oregon and Bend. Wayne Purcell and his family, it took 10 years, 10 years to get permit to build that convention center. So hopefully the citizens and the activists will realize if you want a college in, in Bend, Oregon, this legislature's done our part, but you've got to do your part and use some common sense and get this thing done. Thank you, Representative. Any other comments or questions out from the audience regarding that? So can you stand up and come right over here? Oh, no, Microphone real quick, Jennifer. No I'll come to you. I just outed myself. I was not intending to. Introduce yourself real quick in your affiliation. Okay. Um, okay, so my name is Jennifer Lamoche. I am a commercial real estate broker. I went to high school here in Bend. I graduated in 96. My last 15 years have been spent in higher ed. So this is something that's kind of near and dear to me. What, can you articulate for me 
what does the community need to do? I have seen letter campaigns. I have seen signature campaigns. I have seen, you tell me, what do I need to do to be here, to be heard today? Just tell me that and maybe I can work with that. But I, I don't know that I know and I don't know that people within my community, my neighborhood, know exactly what that means. It takes a lot of working together. It takes common sense. It takes people that don't go to court every time you don't like what's going on. Um, Dr. Johnson has got a group of people trying to find the best location, the best things to put where to put that college. But you know, you can argue, you can take it to court, you can have hearings. As I said, ten years. And as, as Representative Huffman said, uh, whether that money is going to sit there for ten years and not satisfy another urgent need that can get done, um, I don't know. Uh, but uh, Bend, Oregon, you've got something on the that you want, and everyone wants, I think, is, is higher education a four-year program. But did you, like I said, every day of my, every day of everyone up here's life, we get people calling and saying, you know, I got someone upset because they don't want in their backyard. Are you going to, you know, you're going to affect the environment, you're going to affect transportation. You can work together to get these things resolved as a community. Uh, it's very important, I think. Uh, for the stability, economic stability of uh, Bend in Central Oregon uh, to have a four-year university here. I support it. I think everyone the, up here does. Uh, but the ball's in your court now. We can't solve the problem for you. Uh, you've got to go, and, and uh, I know that uh, uh, we've all been to the regional solutions that Dr. Johnson has these groups working on individual things. But like I said, you're experiencing spending state money exactly what people in Bend, Oregon have done for years and years on land use, regulations, and it's got to be solved. You've got to solve it. We, we can't solve it for you. Thank you, Jennifer. I just want to say that there is a public hearing on June 10th uh, on the, the site application, and we welcome both letters submitted to the city as well as public testimony at that time to be at the municipal uh, court uh, here in Bend. Jennifer, are you a chamber member? Are you a chamber member? I believe so, yeah. If you get in contact with me, I might have a couple of items too for you to take a look at that could be helpful. Okay. I'd like to point out a couple of factoids uh, that may inform that question, because it's a really wonderful question. What can I do? Uh, the CRC, there's $125 million in 10 years, and we're no closer today than the day people started planning for the Columbia River Cross. Thank you. The, there was a natural gas facility that was planned in Oregon. That was a $125 million permitting process, never got a permit. So, you know, the key thing as far as I'm concerned is a receptor in Salem, Oregon, is how unified is this community and how do they speak? Do they speak with one voice? So when legislators from Portland, Oregon to Klamath Falls, Oregon, when they're asked what's the top priority for Central Oregon, when they can automatically say it is the Bend Cascade campus, when, when they have that clear message unambiguously branded sort of in the skull, then you know you've done your job. But if there's competing interests, or if there's mixed messages, or if there are other agenda items, people will default, oh, that's not what I'm hearing. So I guess the thing that I would really like you to, to embrace is this. This development is not against the interests of the community, but there are people who will say, this is the fire at Eaton's Gate. This will ruin Ben, this is gonna destroy Ben. There are folks in this community who will litigate this as far as they can and appeal it as far as they can. If they could, they'd probably take it to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The only thing to counter that is how unified is your community? How clearly does it speak to the goal that you share? And if this is going to be a good thing for Central Oregon, I don't want to hear that it's these developers that are going to come into the community and spoil it with traffic and noise and issues and more population. What I want to hear is 
jobs potential, uh, development of our hopes and dreams. Uh, I want to hear a positive, uh, clear, unified message from the community, and that's the thing that you can do that will move the rock and sail, at least uh, from my perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Looks like Senator Canope has something. Yeah, I mean, just directly, I would encourage you to get involved in the public process because that's where we're at now. This has moved from a legislative process down to the local process, and uh, if you strongly believe in that, you want to be involved in the process because uh, typically those who are very unhappy um, can convince local public policymakers that you know they're they're a bigger group than they actually are, and. There's no doubt that through this process, the issues that they brought up need to be addressed. They need to be heard, because that's the process that we're going through. But in the end, this community needs to be unified, moving forward with the branch campus and the buildings uh, being built, because it's it, it was the right thing to do uh, you know, 10 years ago uh, when we were involved in actually bringing the initial programs here, and it's the right thing to do to expand it. Uh, for for our region, so uh, let's move through this process. Let's move through it as quickly as we can, while addressing the, the issues and concerns. But be be positive when you can be positive through this process by writing letters and talking to elected officials about it. Thank you. Any other follow up comments at all about all the hard work that was put into this? Yes, you were just who I was thinking of, quite frankly. <laughs> well. Uh, I don't actually have a lot to add except to say that this was obviously, you know, what a, a 20 year effort to get to the point where we're at now. And it has required a, a very strong showing of community support for the project at a number of different points along the way uh, for, uh, to get to this point. And so um, the only thing I would, I would say is, Obviously, it's important to recognize that sense of community around this project, around building the university, um, but it's not crystal clear to me that, um, that this is just uh, you know, a knee-jerk reaction. There are people who live and work your neighbors in Bend who are concerned about the impact that the construction operation of the university will have on their neighborhood. Um, honestly, I kind of, my office is right across Chandler from uh, the university. And I was thinking, and, and I'm not, uh, shouldn't be listed among the opposition, I'm very supportive of the university, uh, obviously, I hope. Uh, but I was thinking, how am I going to get home if it increases traffic on Reed Market at 5 o'clock? Because if anybody has tried to go east on Reed Market at 5 o'clock, the traffic backs up all the way up now to Farewell Bend Park. And it might be that it will have absolutely no impact at all. But if I lived there and I was concerned about my quality of life and I was concerned about my property values and my kids and you know busy streets and all of the things that we all uh, would naturally think about, um, I'd want to know. And I think, uh, anyway, if there's an opportunity here, I think it's to uh, try to deal with the fears that are driving the opposition in a way that takes the fear away, and then there won't be an appeal. Uh, and, and I know Becky's working on that. That's a process, it's an, an enormous effort, um, but it's probably cheaper than, um, than the legal costs of going all the way through the state uh, Supreme Court. So let's hope we can avoid that um, and find out. I mean, I don't know what the concerns are. I assume it's all, maybe not all, but a lot of it's traffic related. Um, for, who knows what else? Uh, anyway, so I think this is gonna happen. I think the will is still here in this community and I bet you that most of the people who are, are self-identifying as being opposed right now um, don't actually oppose the uh, the existence of a four-year campus in Bend. Uh, they're just concerned about these these unknowns. Any additional comments, Becky, that you, Dr. Johnson, that you'd like to make at all? Is there somebody out here? Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Trig V. Bulkin, I'm in HR at Ben Research, and I just wanted to give a business perspective on what this Cascade campus can do for us and other employers in town. Right now I have, um, by the end of the year, about 30 employees that I need to hire. We're growing, which is awesome. I think that's great. Half the employees I'll be able to find locally because of the skill set that we have here. The other half I'm going to have to look outside of the area. Anywhere from $5,000 to $20,000 to move these employees here to Bend. There's just not a lot of chemists and research engineers just laying around in Bend. So we've been working with Dr. Johnson developing programs that's gonna help our business and help our employees grow while they're here. I'm losing four employees that are going back to school to get their masters. They can't get it here in town, so they're quitting. We're hoping that we can get them back, but I would love for them to stay here in town, continue working for us, and end up getting their masters, developing, growing in their education, and doing that. So, uh, you know, on the business side, it's just, not having this this four-year school here, it's 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 costing us a lot of money that we could reinvest in our employees, our business, and things like that. Good point again. You know, J. V. The, the neat thing about what he said was normally we hear that about relationships between the business community and community colleges. We're talking about a four-year university that is nimble enough to be able to meet the needs of the local business community. And that's unheard of. That, that was an awesome statement. That was, thank you. That's a good thing to point out. Just like the computer science program that's come on board, the accounting and many others that are going forward. So thank you for upholding this level of conversation about such a key community issue that's so current. And one of the things I realized earlier that I left off the table and I apologize as we got going was your opportunity to each share a couple of minutes of what you've been up to and updates that you'd like to put on the table and hear back. We've got some questions and I know the audience does, but if you would be so kind as to honor us with that, I'd love to start with you if you're ready, Senator Cano. You bet. Well, it, it's been an honor to serve you through two sessions and uh, one of the things we obviously worked really hard on was OSU Cascades campus, but Beyond that, uh, things that were really important to this community that I was a champion for were uh, several different bills that would help the private sector create more jobs. And we were successful on uh, a few of those, but uh, some of the bigger ones, uh, we ran into some roadblocks uh, with people in charge that uh, didn't uh, see the full value of them. And one of those was uh, a great bill that I worked with uh, Tony DeBone on, which was uh, a biofuels bill that would allow biofuels to be one of the re essentially renewables or green energy that uh, could be used for uh, public buildings because you have to have one half percent uh, for that. And uh, currently it's pretty much solar and we added geothermal in the 2013 session. So in 2014 session, we tried to do a biofuels bill. So I'll be back with that. Um, and then in 2015, I've had a lot of constituents talk to me about different bills, so I have a, a list of 25 to 30 bills that uh, I'll be introducing. But one of the common themes has been personal. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to be very active, Jason. So uh, one of those is personal privacy. And if you read anything, you see uh, where there are issues with government, I think, uh, overstepping what I consider constitutional bounds as it relates to privacy. And you know, we, we worked with um, people in the private sector, for instance, on the drone bill. Representative Hoffman was a, a key part of that. There's some people in this room that were a key part of that. And, and making sure that, uh, that the law and your privacy is keeping up with the technology that's out there today. And currently it's not. And so there's gonna be a series of, of privacy bills that uh, I'll be working with <coughs> the ACLU on, amongst other people, uh, because privacy is not a partisan issue. So uh, that's just gonna be one example beyond the jobs bills and things that we didn't get done in the last couple of sessions that we'd like to get done for the future. So, uh, and if you have thoughts and ideas, uh, I'm happy to go to 26, 31, whatever, whatever we need to do. Thank you, Senator. That's interesting. Good cross-collaboration there already going on. Thank you. 
I'm Senator Ted Ferrioli. I am probably among you the least known of these stellar celebrities that you have here before you today. I am uh, the senior member of the Senate. I've served 18 years. It's really fun to watch the Tea Party members react to that statement because they say, you're the problem. You are the problem. Uh, I am a Senate Republican leader. My job is to try to get more Republicans in the Senate. So during this election cycle, I'll be working very, very hard on campaigns. Uh, but immediately following that, we have our uh, regularly scheduled, now annual, thanks to you, what were you thinking? <laughs> Legislative sessions. We'll start that right after the election in November, morph directly over into January and February. Uh, you may be shocked to know that the uh, Leave Oregon cities and the uh, associated Oregon counties have asked the Senate Republican office for more than 20 drafts of bills that will regulate mar medical marijuana dispensaries and even looking further down the road, recreational marijuana outlets. So I want to tell you something. Uh, folks are very nervous about what their communities might look like. Uh, uh, what their community Main Street might turn into uh, when business people like yourselves have invested time, energy, blood, sweat, and tears to brand a community what a, mar a medical marijuana dispensary might look like in the closed building or the closed storefront right down on Main Street. So that is uh, one of those issues that I thought was a little bit surprising. Another one that you might find surprising is I'm worried about grouse management. Now, I don't know how that affects Main Street businesses in Bend, Oregon, but I will tell you that if uh, the grouse is listed uh, under the Endangered Species Act, it will do for cattle ranching and grazing uh, and irrigation and agriculture over this arid Intermountain West that we share, what uh, the spotted owl did for forestry. And that was a disaster and it, it looms fairly large. Uh, so we're not really exactly sure what the outcome will be with uh, grouse management, but uh, it will bend and surround will not be unaffected if that occurs. There's so many agricultural commodities uh, upon which this economy depends. If you lose something major like cattle ranching and grazing, it will affect bend. Uh, I'm also concerned about urban growth boundaries. Every community in the state of Oregon is facing the limitations of the land use laws for urban growth boundaries, and the law clearly states that you will have a 20 year supply of suitable and available uh, lands in every category within your urban growth boundary. Do you have a 20 year supply in every category? Of course not. Nobody could have uh, predicted how Bend uh, would develop and what the needs would be on a 20 year basis. Uh, is there a way for us to easily and conveniently go through the urban growth boundary process and arrive at a plan that this community could adopt? Uh, it hasn't been done in less than three to five years, and it's subject to endless levels of appeals. But I will tell you, every community from the Columbia River Gorge all the way to Ontario, which, by the way, that is the size of my district. Uh, I'll go back to that in a second. Are, are having the, the same issues. We have to figure out either a way to regionalize land use planning, cut through the red tape on urban growth boundary expansions, or do it legislatively on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't see us waiting around for the next 10 years to try to figure out how we get through the urban growth boundary process. Um, I mentioned my district is large as 36,000 square miles. It starts in Marion County and Clackamas County and goes to the Idaho-Nevada border. All are part of 11 counties, uh, 36,000 square miles. Population density, a third of a person per square mile. Uh, that would have to increase 18-fold just to reach the level of frontier by the federal definition. So any place I would see a massive crowd like this, I would stop. <laughs> So what, what was it? Yeah. Let me see. I'm going to tell you my agenda. <laughs> what do you have going on for 15? Yeah, for 15, well, uh, I won't be casting any votes. Um, but I do, and I'm going to pass my time to the legislators who will 
actually be casting votes, but I'm gonna draft some bills uh, to offer uh, to my successor. And um, uh, there are a lot of issues that uh, beat my head against the wall on, uh, and that I, I think are, um, you know, are not, uh, not worth getting into detail. The one thing I would say is that the legislature needs to be balanced against the power of the executive. And the reason I say that is uh, right now I don't think there's adequate accountability. Um, and, and this is a global comment, a very high level comment. When you look at the failures of not just Cover Oregon and not just the Columbia River Crossing, um, but uh, what was the, there's a DHS um, IT project that costs 75 million, same vendor, by the way, Oracle, um, that is gonna be scrapped. If, if we could reclaim the money that is just utterly wasted by our state government, we wouldn't have any shortage in our schools and uh, we would have better infrastructure and I think what it comes down to in many cases is a lack of accountability and just the imbalance between the executive and the legislative branch. I say that in part because I'm not going to be a legislator next time um, so I can offer what I think is an objective perspective. The problem is you, we, the, the voters and the taxpayers of Oregon and the moms and the dads and the everybody, the, the recipients of service from the state um, do not have any uh, level of accountability when there is a, a failure. Uh, and I, I could go on and list more of the at least tens of millions, often hundreds of millions of dollars that have been wasted in the last decade. And if you knew, you would just absolutely it, it curl your hair. So with that, I'll return your agenda to you. And Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll uh, join me in expressing our appreciation. I've, everyone up here has had the pleasure of working with Jason uh, for some time, and I want you to know he's fall for men. He uh, fall led the way for the uh, OSU Cascade uh, campus. Uh, so we're uh, going to miss him, and uh, we appreciate his service for people of men. Thank you. Um, now that, let's, I'm sure you know, but everyone up here is in the majority party. But we're all good, and we know how to work the system. What did I say, majority? <laughs> I think everyone up, did all know that we're in the minority party. Um, I've been around a long time, uh, not as long as uh, Senator Ferrioli, uh, but uh, I know that uh, I passed over 13 bills uh, this last the 2013 session. Each one of them had uh, a Democratic co-sponsor because that's the way you get things done. Uh, you have to work across the aisle and I know how to do that. One bill is significant in that it took me three sessions to pass a bill to require students entering bin, entering school system to have visual screening or eye exams. Uh, kids come into school and have not had uh, that and uh, they get behind, they have all sorts of problems. So we finally got that passed that uh, parents have to show record that your child has had uh, visual screening or eye exam uh, to enter a school system. Uh, Oregon Health Plan covers it, Oregon, uh, most uh, Oregon insurance companies cover it, and the professionals have offered to do the service for free if people cannot afford it. So I was real proud of that. Um, uh, both of my bills in the special session uh, passed. As you know now, we have this system meeting every year, which I voted against this strongly disagree with them. And uh, we had, what, three special sessions uh, in 2013-14, won the Nike bill, won the grand bargain, won all these special sessions we had. Uh, thank God we didn't have one for the Crooked River, or the uh, Columbia River crossing. Um, I'm gonna uh, take a minute, Jason, I'm not gonna read all this, uh, but, uh, um, the, um, I think it's important to know, it took me a week in Salem to figure out everything's about money. 
okay? And uh, you have to have money to build four-year schools. You have to have money to build bridges and all this stuff. I'm really concerned. Uh, I was there, uh, several of us here were here in the 2007 session. You remember that? It was uh, a lot of, we had a lot less money, a uh, big decline in money. We're entering this 2015-2017 budget cycle. Uh, the forecast just came out of $135 million for the 15-17 uh, budget. I think the roll-up cost for 15-17 will be much more than $135 million. I think our federal debt to, to cover Oregon may cost more than $135 million. You've got to remember that Oregon's revenue depends entirely upon income taxes. But Oregon's workforce population is less, and what our work people, our workforce is being paid is less. I'm not optimistic about the financial situation that we're going to face in the next legislative session, putting together a 15-17 budget. But we're all up here going to work hard to be the majority. Yeah, we sure appreciate these updates. It's going to give us something wonderful to talk about with each one of you. <coughs> Representative Huffman. Thanks, Jamie. Hard to know where to start because there's so much to talk about. But first, I'm going to start with the public service announcement. This, because I heard Gene and, and uh, Robbie talking about it a little earlier. This Friday afternoon at 1.30 at the Capitol grounds, which is known as Wilson Park. That'd be a great trivia question, by the way. What, what are the Capitol grounds known as? Wilson Park. It's going to be the dedication of the World War II Veterans Memorial on the northwest corner of the Capitol grounds. And so 1.30, if you get a chance to go, it's going to be a great event, and it's a, an awesome looking memorial. And speaking of memorials, for some reason, uh, maybe because I'm a disabled veteran, Gene's a veteran, uh, I serve on the Veterans Committee in the House, uh, the local veterans groups, which have been very active in naming and dedicating legislatively highways in Oregon as Memorial Highways for Veterans, as is Highway 97 is the World War II Veterans Memorial Highway. Gene and I get picked on to uh, introduce legislation, and so one of the bills for 2015 is going to be a bill that names the rest of the veterans groups that have been identified, and we're going to do one comprehensive bill and get it done instead of one bill every session. So it's going to be the I-5 Purple Heart Trail, and Highway 395 is going to be dedicated to World War I veterans, etc. and so on. So that's something Gene and I are going to be working on. Tim talked about, he and I have teamed up uh, with a group that includes ACLU, and uh, we're going to continue to work on the right to privacy bills. And there are five bills. One has to do with automatic license plate readers, and another one has to do with how is your information that is kept on your smartphone going to be protected. If you get pulled over by law enforcement today, they can take your phone and they can hook it into, I can't remember the name of the software program, and download everything on your phone. Well, in a hearing the other day at the Capitol, uh, there was an attorney from Portland and he, he was giving a demonstration of how much information your smartphone has in comparison to the old flip phone that most of us had two months ago? Okay, I'm the only one that had one two months ago, but the rest of you, you know what I'm talking about. And it's amazing the amount of information that can be stored and or transferred on your smartphone. He's an attorney out of Portland, and he said he even keeps a lot of client files on his smartphone. So if he were stopped for some reason and law enforcement decided to hook his phone up to the laptop and download all the information that he has on the smartphone, there would be some problems with client privilege. And so, I mean, it, it was a really cool informational hearing, and that's just uh, to whet your appetite on five of the bills that uh, Tim and I are working on for the 2015 session for uh, privacy. Gene and I are also bird-dogging common core state standards for K-12 to determine appropriateness, working with local school districts and figuring out the, the most appropriate way to implement them statewide, if, if in fact we do. And uh, I'm working on a lot of higher ed stuff, continuing to work with Becky on OSU Cascades and Central Oregon Community College. 
And we've also got our regional institutions that now are allowed to apply to the higher education tech board and determine if they can have their own institutional board. And that covers Eastern, Southern, Western, and OIT. And uh, most of those have already put in their application to have uh, institutional boards, so we'll see how that goes. Um, ways and means, you know, it's going to be interesting in capital construction and full ways and means because the revenue forecasts, the last two have been incremental, incrementally positive, and so that's going to mean that uh, Mike and I have a lot of work to do in figuring out do we spend more money? Do we take on more debt? Do we hold the line where it is? And I think a lot of that will be up to the elections in November. If uh, whoever has control of the House and Senate will determine a lot of those kinds of issues, like how much debt do we have? What's appropriate? Um, so working on a lot of stuff. Uh, from the executive branch, we're gonna be looking at proposals probably from the governor's office. He's had a task force working on revenue, um, you know, should we change the way our t we tax ourselves? Should we have a multi-leg stool, or should we keep it the way it is, dependent on uh, income tax, whether it be personal or corporate? So that's on the horizon. I think the uh, Cover Oregon fiasco is going to remain in the headlines for a, a period of time. So be patient on that. Uh, there was a lot of money spent senselessly, and I'm going to leave it with a lobbying note that you all are very blessed and that you have Eric in the audience tonight. Eric and I actually had a meeting in Salem last week. He's uh, a lobbyist for the city of Bend and doing a great job. He's ever present in the Capitol. And that's, you left early, Jim. I didn't mean, I wasn't going to point that out, but now that you mentioned it, you, no. Anyway, Eric's doing a great job. And then uh, Central Oregon Cities, another organization that represents the Tri-County area and the, the cities within that from uh, Lapine to Sisters are all a part of the sister or Central Oregon Cities. And Doug Riggs and, and Eric and all of us work together to further the agenda for Central Oregon. So it's a, it's a working dynamic in the Capitol. And so if you ever wondered about that, talk to Eric and find out how does the lobbying process actually work and he can fill you in on it, but uh, we've got a good communication system going and it works well for Central Oregon. Uh, now the humor part of our caucus, our leader, Representative Mike McLean. Thank you. Thank you. I just blew it in boy or my arms tired. Oh, wow. You know, Tim, that's Tim's joke. Okay. Um, you know, one of the, I'm Mike McLean. I represent uh, the, from Central Oregon, Prineville, Powell View, La Pine. Uh, so I'm kind of in the, the smaller areas. I work in Bend at Hiller Nash with uh, Jason. And, and uh, so my job is to represent my district. I'm also the House Republican leader. So, like Senator Farrelly, I'm active in uh, negotiations with, uh, with leadership in the House and Senate, and then of course with elections. And if I can make a, a any pitch, it's that um, the House, you know, healthcare is a major issue right now. There's not one doctor in the House of Representatives, not one, and we need one. We have a doctor running in Ben, Dr. Nick Bueller. So my pitch is uh, support Nick Bueller. We need a doctor in the House because frankly, we're making decisions this next biennium over coverage issues, and uh, frankly, we need me. Uh, the other issues that are going to be on in 2014 are tax reform um, and some budget matters. Um, and so please be engaged because uh, the governor really wants to do tax reform. If he's on a fourth term, he'll do tax reform. He wants to do that. It has to begin in the House. He has to have bipartisan support for it. Um, I'm not sure what you think of tax reform. I'm not sure, frankly, what the governor thinks of tax reform. He hasn't said that he wants to reform it. Now, if it's code word for more, take more money from the private sector, get the public sector. You know, there needs to be a darn good reason for that. Perhaps we need to have spending reform as well. But at any event, it's going to be top of them. Uh, lastly, my, my real issues in representing the rural Oregon is economic issues. Um, we, we rise and fall with Bend. Prineville's economy is so tight to Bend, it's silly, right? So every time something good happens in Bend, we celebrate. Um, our 
House District 55's economy is driven, frankly, by Ben and Benford. So I'm always uh, trying to be of assistance. Those of us in Central Oregon work together as a team. In fact, at the Capitol, they often refer to us, sometimes derogatory. Uh, but at any event, you know, as a team, we continue to do things as a team, and we'll continue in 2014 doing things as a team. My other priority is water supply. You can't have economic growth without water supply. People are going to be migrating to Oregon. We'll talk about that. I have some statistics from our economic uh, forecast on the folks who are coming here. Uh, frankly, we have more employed people leaving and more unemployed coming, which, you know, if you just run the numbers, you think, okay, that, that's a problem, and guess what it is? We have, uh, we have growth, but we also have increased uh, demands on our public services, so they're kind of counterbalancing. We can talk more about that. Finally, I do some district-specific bills. What I'm working on now is trying to uh, weigh in on the uh, water issues in South Deschutes County. Uh, we're seeking a goal 11 exception. You know, what I found, at least when it comes to land use, it's a sacred cow in Oregon. I introduced a bill in 2014 to fast track uh, industrial land siting in rural areas. And basically saying, look, you know, we have an opportunity. One thing Primeville has is land, you know. And so the thought was, let's fast track it so if someone was seeking industrial siting, they could say, look, Primeville's a great location. Um, I'd rather be in Bend, but what the hell, let's go to Primeville, they got more land. But the timeline of getting a permit and making decisions is so long that people just pick other companies. You can go down a list of company after company that just chose another state besides Oregon. Um, and so the question was, should we uh, compact those timelines? I just asked, I passed a bill to raise the question and say, you know, could we compact timelines, not waive in appeals or any other decision, but say get to a decision for businesses uh, get to a decision point where businesses can make their decision. You had a thought I shot, uh, you know, an innocent child in the, in the Capitol or something. The hate mail I got. I got to tell you, you know, if Oregon's unwilling to go back to 19, in the 70s and House Bill, Senate Bill 100 in our land use planning, and I'm not advocating revocation at all. I'm just raising my hand saying, could, could we make one adjustment, just one adjustment for rural areas which have U6 unemployment depression era. Could, could we make one adjustment? The answer was absolutely not. So Bend, if you're having problems locating a university, welcome to the pain. If it takes 10 years to locate a university, then welcome to the pain. Because this is the pain that rural Oregon has been experiencing for a long time. We can't get people located because of appeal after appeal after appeal after appeal. And sooner or later, somebody has to stand up and say, we got a problem. Now, when you do that, you become the enemy of environmental groups and a thousand friends and the like. It's not fun being in that position. I didn't have fun. I had to withdraw the bill. Um, but I had to ask the question because Craneville missed out on some opportunities because the timeline for decisions so long. What I'd encourage, Ben, is you guys are the power base for Central Oregon. If you get behind something, it'll happen. Maybe, just maybe, we should actually stand up and say, maybe there needs to be a time limit of how long it takes to get a permit. And let's just start there. It's a great dialogue to have. And maybe this university is a test case. But at any event, thank you for having me today. And I apologize profusely uh, for any jokes that don't go <laughs> Big round of applause for Wow, that was a good look. So I'm sure there's some questions out on the floor here right away. If you would go ahead and stand up. And I know Jeff, you've got a couple. I want to get you engaged as well. Okay, let's see who you are and who you're affiliated. Yeah, Brian Stalkup with Sherpa Well Strategies. And I wanted to talk about the tax reform issue. I grew up in Washington, which has a terrible and unbalanced system on sales tax. I had the opportunity to live all over the country before settling in Oregon, which has another terribly unbalanced system. And I think the system that was the best was Virginia, which had about a, I'm gonna get the numbers a little bit wrong, but maybe a four and a half percent sales tax, a five percent income tax, and a state property tax. And it seemed to smooth out the rough edges. It doesn't mean their revenue didn't go down in 2008 like everybody else's, but it did smooth out the rough edges. And I just wonder, what's the realistic 
possibility of add, you know, lowering that marginal income tax rate and raising or starting a sales tax? Well, thank you for the question. I guess the question is how much do you trust uh, the ballot initiative process? Because um, what's happened in California is they, they went to that system. And Representative they, McLean, we've had a request. Will you hold up your mic a little bit? Oh, I'm sorry. Lots of peripheral noise back out there. The, in California, for an example, that went to a system of a cocktail of taxes, of um, sales tax, income tax, et cetera, what they had is um, in it, that it had a base level that was agreed upon, and then it was incrementally increased to the highest tax state. And what we found in uh, there, in, when you look at them, is on by initiative process, um, it was the inverse of Prop 13 in California. They would raise the rates. Now, I'm not saying who. You could probably speculate. Um, but they would increase the rates incrementally, and it's like boiling a frog one degree at a time. And what they had is over a 20-year period, they became the highest tax rates. Now, the challenge in since all revenue bills, the tax bills, has to begin in the House, uh, I've certainly agreed with the governor that we would entertain the conversation, but I've asked him to solve one problem. And the problem is, how do we trust, um, and I'll just be frank, that the public employee unions don't put on initiatives that they did this year, by the way. Um, SEU put on the ballot. They since withdrew it to raise income taxes in Oregon up to 12.5% and 13.6%. Now, if we have a 5, 5, and 5, which ultimately the governor has not committed to any plan, but I think that's where he's headed. The question is, if we do that, we open the door for a colossal tax increase by incrementation of these ballot initiatives. And I'm not sure I'm ready to commit to that. Second of all, is that you've had a historic rejection of sales tax. And uh, you know, I don't know if that's a full zero. Can I just make one follow-up comment? Sure. I'm not sure I trust the initiative. I'm not sure I trust the initiative process either, but I'm asking for some leadership from the people at this table so that we don't have to go through the initiative process. If you guys could come up with a credible plan and get some buy-in from people around the state that we might be able to fix it before we have the initiative process. Well, that's it, the taxpayers are gonna do it for you and you're not gonna like it. Well, let me give you a political answer to a political question. The, uh, the building is empty, devoid of people whose tax plans were floated. It's just one of those things that's like the third rail. So I appreciate the fact that you've invited us all to touch the third rail. It's a little bit difficult to do, even for John Kitsop. And let me point out what, what I think has happened to, to John, and I can call him John, personal friend, we're like this. Um, John Kitsauber has asked for and gotten permission from Oregonians to vertically integrate K-12 education, and he's done so. So his advisory board answers to the governor. This is part of what we're saying when we say the executive branch is much more powerful now than, than the legislative branch. He has vertically integrated higher education, even though we see these institutions now having more autonomy than they have in the past. We still see an advisory board that answers directly to the governor. He has vertically integrated healthcare transformation, and that is a different animal than Cover Oregon. Healthcare transformation is the community care organizations and how healthcare is distributed in the private sector as well as in the public sector. That's a vertical integration. And he's taken uh, the ideal, and he's a great ideal guy, uh, he's taken the ideal of universal health care coverage under uh, Cover Oregon. And, you know, the details are not as promised. The, the ideal is still a great ideal. The execution is where the failure is. This is a guy who started his third term with the highest potential credibility of any political leader in Oregon. And, and maybe, maybe as great as some of the mythic leaders of the past, uh, McCall and others. Uh, but over the past year and a half to two years, his credibility has become, I would say, pretty threadbare. And it's entirely on the governor's credibility that he invited Oregonians and made a promise. He said, I will undertake uh, revenue reform after I'm elected. 
Now, I thought that was really interesting because it's sort of, you know, the package is still wrapped up with a ribbon on it. We don't know what it is. There's no details. But I will tell you, politically speaking, he does not have the credibility to even broach the subject of revenue reform at this moment. And I'm not sure I see a rehabilitation until we're out of the woods on Cover Oregon and we, and we all have decided what healthcare transformation actually delivered to us. So that's a political answer to your question. Um, my question actually follows up on what Senator Ferrioli just uh, touched on, and that's Cover Oregon. Um, first, and it's kind of two questions. The first is, what went wrong? And the second is, what, if anything, is the legislature going to do? Well, thank you for that question. So uh, one in four Oregonians, almost a million, are on Cover Oregon, on Medicaid. That is completely unsustainable. And uh, I think, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think a lot of people at this, uh, this table didn't agree with Obamacare and uh, what occurred. And so uh, Cover Oregon is at the point where uh, it needs to be shut down. It doesn't do anything that other government agencies don't already do. It's an extra layer of government, and get this, they just introduced an increase in their fee of $9 and like 48 cents or something per member per month to like 966. Understand that they're going to be doing much less than they're currently doing because they're giving that to the federal government to do. So uh, it's a it's incredibly um, disappointing, I think, for everybody that this isn't just a website issue. This is uh, a government that can't get it right issue. And healthcare isn't partisan and it isn't political. It's personal. It's personal to you and it's personal to me and you ought to be the ones in control of it. It shouldn't be the government telling you what plan, how much, uh, you know, how high you get to jump. Uh, and you don't have to look any further than the VA to understand what happens when you have a government that's completely running the healthcare system. So um, we need to shut down Cover Oregon and we need to put pressure on our federal government to, uh, I believe, to repeal and replace Obamacare. A lot of people say with what? Uh, and that is an easy answer. The easy answer is take the things from uh, Obamacare that people like. For instance, uh, you can keep your kids on your policy till you're 26. You don't have to worry about pre-existing conditions. Uh, you get to use uh, some of your, or you get to have um, basically checkups that uh, aren't going to cost you or don't uh, go to your deductible. But the important thing is, is that you're in control of it, that you are the one that gets to pick the plan, you are the one that gets to decide how much you're going to spend, and ultimately you are the one uh, that works that out with your health care providers, your doctors, and so on, uh, without the government being a middleman. And so uh, that is a shift away from where we're currently headed, and I can guarantee you that there's going to be more pain involved the further we go down this road. It's not being paid for because the federal government is broke. Uh, it borrows 46 cents of every dollar it spends, so it's not paying for it. Uh, so it's just a cost shift to borrowing, essentially. And so when we, uh, when we get to the point of no return, which I think we're approaching very rapidly, um, hopefully people will decide that it's better for them to be in control of their health care than the government is. Uh, we just had hearings on Cover Oregon. Uh, was it last week? Less than days? Yeah. Uh, and so the third executive director, the guy who is apparently has a very uh, good reputation as a turnaround expert, um, came in and, and gave a, a PowerPoint presentation, at least on the, on the House side, and I think on the Senate side too. Um, and it, it, it would blow your mind if, if I had that presentation here. It's online. Can, you can look it up on the Oregon Legislature website. Um, but what they said, so uh, after an enormous amount of effort um, in the 20, 
uh, 14 short session, three tries actually. Uh, I, I made some amendments that required Cover Oregon to come back with a business plan. Well, they didn't. They didn't do it um, like they were supposed to according to the statute. But they at least brought financial projections. And what they showed is that at the end of this year, the end of 2014. Cover Oregon will have $1.88 million left. That's with a revenue projection, if you could call it that, of about $6 million a year from the money that they're extracting from people who purchase private insurance through Cover Oregon. Um, and a burn rate of about almost $5 million a month, which means unless I'm completely math challenged, I'm sorry to throw a bunch of numbers at you, they're gonna run out of money in January. And our opportunity to dig in and hold them accountable was extremely limited, um, mostly because of time constraints and because those folks have mastered the art of the filibuster and they just sit there and talk and talk and talk and talk so you can't ask questions. Um, $1.88 million at the end of the year and $6 million in revenue. It, it is, and, and I swear to you, they said it with a straight face. So, Cover Oregon is just a, it really is just a website. It's just a, it's a public corporation that was supposed to create this website where you could go and buy insurance from private insurance companies that list their Obamacare compliant plans on the website. And if you did, as a consumer, and, and you were eligible, you could get the, uh, the tax subsidies under the Affordable Care Act. That's all it was supposed to be. $200 million later. Well, 50 was the Oregon Health Authority. I'm trying to be fair with Cover Oregon. They only spent 200 of the 250 that got blown on that project. There's no website. And uh, all of the numbers that you hear in the news about the people who have enrolled in Cover Oregon are, I think, intentionally distorted because they lump Medicaid uh, beneficiaries in with people who purchased private health insurance. There are less than 60, just north of 50,000 people who have actually paid a premium to purchase private insurance uh, through Cover Oregon. Remember there were 140,000 policies that were canceled. Not people, but policies that were canceled. 50,000 have bought insurance through that website. That actually, they, not through the website, but through a hybrid process that involves manually filling out applications in the, you know, the uh, world headquarters of Cover Oregon. So, this is the biggest, most unbelievable failure I think I have ever seen. How can you spend two hundred and fifty million dollars to produce a web portal? And it, I'm not saying it's easy. But that's a lot of money in two and a half years. I, you can't make this stuff up. So they're gonna run out of money. They are, uh, they're going to push the Medicaid back on the Oregon Health Authority, which by the way, you know, before there was Cover Oregon, we already had a bureaucracy to determine Medicaid eligibility and sign people up for Medicaid, where people you know, get state uh, and federally funded health insurance, that's Medicaid or the Oregon Health Plan. So Cover Oregon didn't add any value in that respect. You see those numbers, that's just complete smokescreen stuff. So they're gonna push Medicaid back to the Oregon Health Authority and they're gonna run out of money and uh, well, speaking of running FBI out of money, investigation will, will We're starting to run out of time. Us. We've got a couple other questions. Thank you very much for weighing in on that. I know you're very passionate and rightly so. We should be as well. I'm just thoroughly disgusted. There you go, there you go. We have a question here. Glenn Wisling with the Bethlehem Inn, and uh, you addressed some of the issues about uh, unemployed. Um, we currently have about 90 people staying at the homeless shelter here in town, and we are not, a they're not able to find housing. So what role does the state play in dealing with the affordable housing issue, and what are, what are some of the things that we might be able to do? Well, thank, thank you. You know, recently there was a roundtable discussion, perhaps you were there, about trying to allow accessory dwellings in Bend to accommodate some of the housing in Bend. The answer was, no way, no how, no way, no. 
So the reality is, uh, under the current land, land use matrix, um, you, we are stuck with the process, uh, and this is unfortunately part of the consequence, is the market is not able to react in a timely fashion to demand. And uh, so even an interim solution, um, for an example, like says, accessory dwellings or other places to produce some low-income housing or some rental situations, was rejected by those who, um, you know, Central Oregon Land Watch, et cetera. So um, I'm, I'm not sure uh, of how to get that accomplished. Um, I, I will say that with the migration into Oregon being uh, that uh, when you look at people who are employed who leave the state and people who are employed who enter the state, they balance each other out. But when you look at the people who are un unemployed uh, or looking for employment who leave the state versus come in, it's it's almost a two to one. We are a net recipient of the unemployed. And then when you look at people who have left the labor force, they've, they've just said, I'm no longer going to be looking for a job. Again, same statistic. When you have a state that's whose uh, costs are exceeding uh, economic growth, um, we're in this uh, catch-22. And that in order to um, in produce a certainty to increase the speculation of the housing building, uh, the numbers uh, weigh against it. To increase the speculation or private investment in order to produce the loan from housing you need, uh, they look at the time frame of getting to permits versus appeals, and it weighs against it. I'm not sure this gets solved. Um, one thing that would be helpful, however, is a coalition of the willing that basically says we, we have to solve it, and therefore we need in certain areas, whether it be low-income areas like that I represent, or where you have a concentration of a need like in Bend, we have to be able to go to the legislature and say we have to find a way to compress timelines for decisions. I hate to beat that drum, but I think that's an answer for both of our districts. One of the ways to go to the legislature, and I was talking to Tom about this earlier, make sure that you're involved in the local regional solutions, Central Oregon Regional Solutions that's headed up by Annette Liebig, and also make sure that the Bend City Council understands what the need is and that you're on their priority list so that they then turn to Eric and say, Eric, this is one of our priorities going into the session, and we want you to elevate the lobbying effort for low-income housing. So it's all tied together. You just need to make sure that your agenda is on everybody else's agenda so it's being talked about and safe. All right, we're close to five minutes here. Did you have a comment, Eric? You're the mystery man. You might as well stand up in the audience. I wanted to, uh, my name is Eric Hansler. I'm a, I'm a lobbyist, among other clients. I lobby for the city and appreciate Representative Huffman's kind words. Um, of course, in addition to working through those of us that work in the building, Citizens can also show up at the building. Uh, lobbyists, we like to think that we control a lot of things we really don't, in terms of OSU cascades and issues that are of a, of a community significance. There's no substitute for people actually showing up in the Capitol, uh, whether it's written testimony, whether it's oral testimony, whether it's visits with your legislators and, and encouraging other people that you know to do the same. The citizen, involved, the citizen involvement speaks volumes and uh, we can do a lot of the work, but ultimately we're working on behalf of, of all of you that live here. You guys can just as easily show up on your own. And that says a lot to the folks that work in the building and to see the commitment, especially when you're traveling two and a half hours, you're traveling over the mountains, you're taking the time out of your day to do that. Uh, that's, that's a very worthwhile effort. People can get jaded on politics in a lot of cases, but I've seen uh, day in and day out the impact that that can have. So I encourage everybody to get involved directly on the issues that you're passionate about. Jeff, final comments from you yeah, and questions. Just a, a quick question for Jason. As I think probably everyone in the audience knows, he just went through a very arduous statewide uh, campaign for the U.S. Senate. Can you give us some reflections on what you learned from that process and what, what that was like? Great question. <laughs> wow. Let's see, uh, short version is this is an amazing state. It's full of amazing people. Uh, it has unlimited potential. Um, sadly, I, I think, I, in my view, um, 
government is moving into a position, both federally and, and to a certain extent, lesser extent in the state, uh, where it's more adversarial than helpful in a lot of cases. Um, that's especially true in rural Oregon where there's not as much of a voice, um, you know, in, in the capital. Um, and gosh, don't run in a contested primary. That's, that's my advice. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun, it was an enormous amount of effort, um, and it was quite an honor just to be able to, to run and uh, to have the opportunity to participate in that process. Uh, but the one really serious uh, negative that I took away from it is that uh, the importance of money in politics uh, is cliche because it's true. You know, if you can't, uh, uh, you know, I think we got outspent four to one, uh, which essentially, it, you can see where we lost, where we just didn't have the money to compete on ad budget um, with my opponent. Uh, it, it, there's just a lot of people, and it costs a lot to reach them and tell them who you are and tell them about what you'd like to do. Um, so that's, that for me was a negative because it was so overwhelmingly significant, so decisive. Uh, I'm not advocating public financing. I don't know how to solve the problem, honestly, but it is a problem. Uh, but again, I have absolutely no regrets from spending nine months of my life uh, just beaten, bruised, bloodied. I, I'm scarred for life. <laughs> it, it was it was a it was a fantastic experience. <laughs> Thank you again to all of you for showing up this evening and sharing your time, your insights, and all the hard work that has gone down the path, especially for your service, Jason. Again, we applaud you for that. They are appropriately ended with applause. Sorry. And each and every one of you, I know you travel out here, John, to join us. And Mike, you get uh, on the road back and forth from places. And each and every one of you have something. So big round of applause for all of you. get plugged in to stay in touch and to see how we can be unified as a voice. So thank you all of you.